You're listening to the greatest multifamily investment advice show. My name is Adam Ross, and now I'm talking everything multifamily for an in-depth conversation, and I will be diving deep into raising capital, deals, and underwriting process. Welcome back to the greatest multifamily advice show. Today, we have a special guest with more than 35 years in commercial real estate, the highest total ever sales broker in New York with more than $20 billion in sales. Please help me to welcome our special guest today, Robert Nickel. How are you today? Great, Adam. How are you doing? It's a pleasure to, to be here with you. Thanks so much for being with us today with your busy schedule. Uh, I would like to start with your journey on, on this, this 40 years on commercial real estate. How it started, especially that you've been on different market cycle? What was the beginning for you? Yeah, well, I, I got into the business actually in uh, during the summer between freshman and sophomore year in college. Uh, at that time, it was uh, a very crazy time relative to interest rates. Uh, I think the prime rate at that time was about 18% uh, and uh, went back and worked at CB my, my two other summers uh, and then started with uh, what was then called CB Commercial in Manhattan in 1984 when I got out of school. Uh, at the time, I can remember that you know we were we were long away from the the eighteen percent days, but we were still doing uh, transactions at twelve caps and thirteen caps, wow. and that's about what lending rates were at that time. But um, it was coming out of a time that was very very challenging from a, uh, an interest rate perspective, and uh, you know over the years have been through. Uh, through many cycles. And, uh, you know, I, I always say the market has been, is, and always will be cyclical. And we just have to deal with different market conditions as they come along, as we, we ebb and flow with these different market cycles. Uh, regarding the, the up and down on, on, uh, on the market, uh, I'd like the, the advice of uh, Blackstone chairman, uh, Steve, uh, about the actual going on the market. What is your advice to, a commercial investor when they're dealing with, uh, with the downturns. Like what, right now, we still, we don't know when is we, we're going to hit the bottom. Uh, we hope that we hit the bottom soon by February. We still have a two interest hike on February and March. We're waiting for the feds. But what is your advice to commercial investors and multifamily spaces and uh, office spaces about dealing with the markets now, especially with challenge challenge market like New York? Yeah, you know, well, I have to say, and it's important to preface all my statements by by saying that I only operate in New York. So uh, my comments are germane to the New York market, may not be applicable to other areas. And I know in New York, uh, it really varies product type to product type. Uh, the multifamily market here uh, is operating surprisingly well, uh, despite the the tremendous political headwinds that we have. Uh, it's been several years now that um, the policy changes have gone very, very against uh, the interest of property owners, um, and that doesn't seem to be abating at all. Um, but notwithstanding that, there's still a very surprising level of demand. Clearly, cap rates have seen some upward pressure based on the increase in interest rates, but there's still very significant demand for multifamily. Uh, the land market has seen a, a big reset in value. Uh, I sell a lot of land here. And uh, although the Fed started raising rates in March, uh, it really didn't start to tangibly impact the real estate market until the beginning of September, uh, when lending rates really started to go up. So we've seen just since the beginning of September, land values in, in Manhattan are down 20 to 25%. Uh, which is uh, a, a big drop in a relatively short period of time. Uh, the office market is very, very challenging to figure out. People are still trying to, to understand when the return to the office uh, will happen. Uh, we're still below 50% in terms of physical occupancy, and that, that needs to improve. Uh, so folks are having a very difficult time underwriting rents for vacant space. Um, and the retail market seems to have some some bright spots, actually. Uh, there's been downward pressure exerted on retail rents uh, for several years. 
Uh, it seems that retail rents have um, have stopped going down and have stabilized. Leasing activity is picking up. And for the first time in many years, we're, we're having investors call us asking us if we have any retail properties for sale. So it, it really varies product type to product type. Clearly, the, the industrial market is doing very well. Uh, industrial, because of zoning in New York, uh, makes up a very small slice of the of the market. Uh, so it doesn't really move the needle one way or another, but fundamentals in in the industrial market are fairly good as well. But it it really varies property type to property type. So be, because we're talking about the recession now and the, the different assets types on on, on commercial spaces, uh, what do you see the similarity between the eighties and nineties uh, recession to now, especially that the main factor back then was an unemployment rate, whereas the employment rate here is really good. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities, uh, but uh, everyone's saying that this one is not similar to 2008. It's more like the 90s. What is the similarities you see in the market between 90s and now? Yeah, well, I think that uh, the recession in 08, 09 was relatively short. Um, if you look at where we are in New York City, the correction in the investment sales market really began in October of 2015. Mm -hmm. And from October of 15 through February of 2020, it was mostly a volume correction. The volume of sales in terms of dollar volume dropped 56% over that period of time. Number of properties sold was down 54%. Value had only declined by uh, about 10 to 12% if you lump all property types together. Uh, and then COVID came along in March of 2020 and converted this mostly volume correction into a value correction. Um, so value started to fall more rapidly. Uh, we started to have a, uh, a recovery uh, that started in April of, of 2021. Second half of 21 and the, the first half of 22 were great. And then these interest rate increases have the market going back down again. Mm -hmm. So this has been over a very, very long period of time. In fact, if if you take out that, that small positive uh, 12 months we had um, at uh, that ended in, in mid-22, um, you know, it's the longest correction we've had, even during the savings and loan crisis in the early 90s, that was only a four year correction. Yes. But, you know, from from my perspective, I think that this market cycle has been a lot more like the the early 1990s than uh, the 08, 09 um, um, recession. I agree. I agree. Uh, uh, let me ask you another question, because all of our uh, guests and syndicators is more focused on other markets than New York. And the, the issue about New York is uh, it's more like uh, more investor, I think, friendly for institutional uh, investment, more uh, less for regular syndicators. From your perspective, how you see New York market fundamentals, especially with a new net migration from uh, all of the states on the north to the south. What is the advantages of New York versus other market like, for example, Texas? Well, I, I still think, and, and there are plenty of places that are great places to live and work. I, I think New York is fantastic. Clearly, my perspective is skewed because I, I've lived uh, lived in Manhattan for, for almost 39 years now. Yeah. Um, so I love the city. I think it's the greatest place in the world. Uh, we have tremendous uh, culture and uh, so many different uh, things that you can take advantage of here in the city. Uh, I think that um, what's important for the future of the city is that um, our uh, elected officials understand that, you know, whether they are on the, the right side of the aisle or the left side of the aisle, you can't do anything without revenue. And you don't have revenue unless you have a, a thriving business community and a thriving real estate community. So a lot of the policy changes that have been implemented uh, have actually been detrimental to the real estate market uh, and detrimental to the business community. Uh, that's not a good thing. Um, we're still waiting to see what numbers are going to look like uh, relative to the folks that have moved out of New York. Uh, there has been, uh, you know, a, a net out migration uh, within the city. Uh, the sheer numbers don't really matter that much. What really matters is that in 2019, 
there were 1,600 families in New York that paid 27% of our income taxes. Mm. Uh, those are all folks that probably have three, four, or five homes, uh, and it's easy for them to change their uh, their primary residence. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how many of those folks are still primarily domiciled in New York. But you know, I think that New York offers a um, a significant value proposition. There still are a lot of uh, young folks that want to come live here and work here. Uh, if you talk to multifamily owners that uh, own um, uh, free market apartments, uh, they'll tell you that uh, for the past year or two, 75% of the leases that they've made have been to people who are coming to New York from outside New York, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very positive thing. But you know, we need to to keep people wanting to come uh, to New York to live and work. Uh, so we need safe streets, we need clean streets, we need uh, an environment that is conducive uh, to people wanting to uh, to come here. So uh, we're hoping that um, the political changes that have occurred. Um, you know, over the past year or two, we'll start to take hold and, um, you know, make this uh, the, the great, great city that that it is, it always has been and hopefully always will be. As the chairman of the New York office, uh, Anjal, um, after 40 years of experience, how you describe your superpower? How do I describe my what? Superpower. My superpower. Okay, well, <laughs> let me first say I I, I am the uh, the head of the private capital group in New York, um, but um, I the success in this business is uh, is mostly reliant on uh, the the team of people you have around you, uh, and I've always had uh, great people to work with, whether it was uh, at at my my old firm. Uh, or any of the other firms I've been at. I've always had great people with me. Uh, you know, my partner now, John Hageman, has been with me for 20 years. Many of the people that uh, that I work with here at JLL came over with me from Cushman and Wakefield, which were all with me at Massey Nackle before we sold to Cushman. Uh, so I think it's, it's really that there's um, individual brokers have qualities that uh, that allow them to succeed. But I think to really succeed and to succeed over a long period of time, you need great people around you. And it's always a team effort. Um, I think on an individual basis, if you look at the people in our industry uh, who do really, really well, uh, it's folks who uh, have a specialty. Uh, they can easily articulate their value proposition to, to potential clients. Um, you know, What do you specialize in? What can you do better than anybody else? Um, and being able to differentiate yourself from all the other people that are trying to um, to uh, do what you do uh, is important because that differentiation uh, often leads to a competitive advantage. Um, having passion for this business is one of those things that drives people, and you'll see the the folks who are are, are really at the top of their game are very very passionate about what they do. For for many of us. Uh, the uh, the business is not only a career, it's a hobby as well. Uh, so we spend a lot of time doing it. Uh, and I, I think discipline is uh, is another key ingredient to success. Um, I think that um, you know a lot of what we do and have to do uh, is uh, are relatively mundane things, things that you have to do day after day, week after week, month after month. Um, like making calls, like, uh, you know, I have my call sheets. I'm still very old school. Here's a call <laughs> sheet with a property. Yeah. Uh, I make my handwritten notes on it. And uh, I have a stack of these things. And I just sit here every day. I go through these. My my number one goal is to, uh, to speak to 100 property owners every week. And uh, that has been the goal for a while. And so I think it's it's a combination of things. If you you call it superpowers, you call it uh, whatever you you want to call it. But I, I think the the folks who really do well, very very passionate, uh, they're specialized and deliver a a great value add to their clients, and they're very disciplined about what they do, how they do it, allocating time, time management, uh, and that kind of thing. But it's uh, it's the most fun business in the world. I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. And uh, I, I feel very fortunate that I still love the business as much today uh, as I did when I started.
agree. And my final question will be, which book really changed your perspective about the business? Uh, what book? Well, you know what? There are so many great books that uh, that uh, I read. I read a lot about selling, mm. uh, about psychology, persuasion, uh, why people do what they do. Uh, I think uh, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, is a fantastic book. You talk about specialization. He talks about something called the hedgehog concept, where you figure out what you can do better than anybody else in the world and gear everything towards towards doing that. Um, one of my college professors, uh, Richard Schell at the Wharton School, wrote a great book called The Art of Woo. Uh, there is the uh, the Harvey McKay books, uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, Keith Ferrazzi, Never Read Alone. Uh, great uh, Harvard professor, Bill Urey, wrote a book called The Power of a Positive No, which is a great book. Um, he has so many, uh, so many great books that uh, that teach you why people do what they do. And if you think about it, most people in the real estate business are intermediaries. They're working with other folks and you're hoping that you can influence people to do uh, what you'd like them to do um, and what you think is in their best interest. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you, you read the books on persuasion um, by probably the leading authority on persuasion in the United States is the head of the psych department at University of Arizona, uh, Bob Cialdini. Uh, he's written great books on persuasion. There's so many great books out there to, uh, to, to learn from, uh, get insights from. And, uh, you know, our, the real estate business is a people business. It's about interacting with people. And uh, the more you understand about how to do that, how to do that effectively, it's, uh, it's a great thing. And uh, it makes the business that much more enjoyable. Great insight from one of the biggest leaders on New York. I appreciate your time today. And we're really happy to bring you again to the show to talk about New York again. Again, I appreciate your time. My pleasure, Adam. It was great to be here with you today. Thanks.